entrusting so much of knowledge to the budding doctor thank you for the opportunity given thank you madam for this uh, for your presence and uh, with this uh, we will uh, wind up the inaugural function uh, we'll move on to the scientific program uh, we will move on to the first session and uh, we have uh, the coordinators for the first session on the carcinoma cervix and the gtn session and uh, dr letha and dr mumtaz are the coordinators for the first session dr letha chaturvedula she is the head of professor and head of the department of ong at uh, jipmer pondicherry and a uh, lot of uh, awards to her credits and her area of interest is high risk obstetrics oncology and infertility and a uh, lot of publications also to her credit and very happy to say that uh, uh, dr letha is was my senior at uh, jipmer so uh, then uh, we have uh, dr mumtaz uh, Uh, Dr. Mumtaz, uh, uh, she is the professor, uh, and senior professor in the department of ONG at MES Medical College, Pindalmana, and she has won a lot of awards: Kalyani Kutiyamma Memorial Gold Medal Award, Tampan Memorial Award, Amarendra Nath Don Prize, and uh, uh, KFOG President's Award, etc. And uh, she uh, she has also won the Wonder Fox in award in 2019. So. I uh, now I hand over the mic to uh, Dr. Mumtaz and Dr. Letha to conduct the proceedings for uh, today's rest of the uh, session. Over to you, Dr. Mumtaz and Dr. Letha. Shall I share the screen? Yeah, yeah. You can share. Can you see the screen? Is it shared? Yeah, we can see. We can see. You have to put in slide show. Yes. So today evening we are going to start with the cancer survey session, and for this we have two chairpersons, two eminent teachers, postgraduate teachers in gynecology, obstetrics, and gynecology. I take this opportunity to introduce the chairpersons first. Uh, Dr. Chellamma V K was the professor and H O D at Calicut Medical College uh, at K M C T Medical College. Madam was the postgraduate teacher and professor at Calicut Medical College previously. Madam has taught more, most of us, and uh, Madam is very actively involved in the uh, Calicut O G Society, and also she was in, in involved in the I M S National Examination Committee and Q S Committee. and she has also received the best doctor award in 2017 and next chair person is dr lakshmi uh, madam is the additional professor in the department of obstetrics and gynecology at government medical college manjeri madam is also the secretary of og society in 2018 and 19 and she is currently the vice president of calicut og society and she has got special interest in high risk pregnancy and endoscopy fetal medicine I hand over the mic uh, to our chairpersons, respected madams, uh, Chellamma madam and uh, Lakshmi madam, for carrying this session forward. Hello, hello. Ah uh, yes, ma'am, you are audible. Good evening to all of you, and welcome uh, all of you to the South India PGCME Gynec Oncology Conference. So I am very happy and privileged to introduce Dr. Neeraja Patla. Uh, she is the professor of OBGYN at Old India Institute of Medical Sciences. So I remember her as the uh, chairperson, oncology chairperson of OBGYN, when I was also the member, and now chairperson of oncology committee figo, and had undertaken numerous research projects, especially in the cervical cancer uh, prevention, in collaborate with the international agencies for research in cancer. So Dr. Nayaraja Patla, welcome to this CME and. Uh, you start your presentation thank you so much madam thank you for a very kind introduction it is so nice to see all the friends from kerala again today i thank dr alpesh dr neeta dr bhagyalakshmi and it is so nice to see all the luminaries dr rashwat dr ramani dr shekran i have been looking at uh, for some time so thank you dr kunji moedin dr lata for arranging this opportunity that i can be here with you all today and really nice to have a, pro a program for the post graduates really because it is the need of our so i am just going to share my slides 
Um, so in this short time that we have, I'm going to very crisply try to convey to you about screening methods for cancer cervix, because we know that uh, this is a nutshell really of what I'm going to say. I, I think all PGs should know this whole slide. That cervical cancer screening program started with regular pap screening as the primary test. We could never do those. So VI tests were found to be of equal sensitivity for LMICs. We started doing that. The HPV tests first came as triage tools. So what is triage? If there is ASCUS, there's a lot of patients with ASCUS, but all of them will not progress to high-grade CIN. So HPV was to triage out, select out those ones who are the serious. But then the superiority of HPV tests as screening test got established because of the far greater sensitivity. So it went to co-testing. And then we had a quantum shift when HPV testing got accepted as the primary testing modality for cervical cancer screening. This is a nutshell of what I am going to tell you. But briefly, since I am the opening batsman today, I am going to touch upon the Globocan 2020 data. Globocan is the data put out by International Agency for Research on Cancer from time to time. It is the WHO's research wing. And this collates data for every country based on the reports from their registries with a factor of other socio-demographic, geographical, and other factors that they look at. And what do we see now in 2020? If we look at both sexes, is combined males, females, all ages, breast cancer is number one. This is an amazing um, uh, realization we have to face that breast cancer, which is mainly in women alone, is more even than lung for both sexes. So these are the two we have here, breast and cervix, which are preventable, early detectable. And these are the ones, if we look at females, you see breast worldwide is a huge problem. And cervix is also there at number four. And these are the deaths in the similar proportions. The color gradings remain the same. If you people have seen, been seeing these charts before, they have not changed much. The, uh, there is more, this thing. In fact, if we look at the number of cases in India, the projection has now increased back to the six digit number. 124,000 cases almost every year, new cases more than any other country individually, deaths at 77,000 more than any other country individually. So these I think are numbers which PGs should know. Of course, we ha always have this problem for many years. Asia has nearly half or little more than half the burden and within Asia, actually India, China, and Indonesia account for the largest section of the pie, both for the new cases and for the deaths. Now, I've already touched upon this, so I'm not, but it is important always to see the large proportion who are going to mortality. This red line can be much, much smaller if we have patients catch, catching patients early, as are coming in stage three, so so many of them are lost. And now this figure of the age standardized rate, which was 14.7 in the last global can, has been projected at 18 this time, the death rate 11.4, and the prevalent cases proportion is 42.8. So coming to screening, and this is very important concept, which all PGs, all gynecologists must have is that what is the transformation zone and how do you identify the transformation zone? And this is the area all around, which is between the squamocolumna junction as we see it and the most distal cervical gland opening or nebothian follicle which shows that till where the squamocolumna had receded. And then as you know, the metaplasia occurs, what we sometimes loosely call the healing erosion. And we have the new squamous epithelium coming back. 
So we have this area which is derived from the metaplastic epithelium. This is where more than 90% of our cancers arise. If we take cytology, we must scrape this whole area. If we take HPV, we must take from this whole area. If we do VIA, we must see this whole area. And if we do treatment by cryo or ablation, we must treat this whole area. So transformation zone is a very important concept for all our PGs. So in uh, 2018, Foxy brought out the resource-based screening and management guidelines. These are available freely on the net. Anybody is not able to get, can uh, get this, download this from the Foxy website or write to me, I will send you. It should be on your phone, the charts, and you can see what to do. And it is also now a publication in the JOGR, which you can get. This was our meeting with many, many people, not only from Foxy, but also the other representatives who came together for this. So the most important thing is that Foxy doesn't say that if you don't have one particular test, it's, you cannot screen, no. We say choose any test. First and foremost, any test is better than no test. But if you are doing cytology, be aware that quality control is very important and if you have a good quality cytology, you are welcome to continue with the same. Definitely see whether you can do HPV also. If you can, that is a better test. I will show you some slides to explain that. If you can, don't think that you can do HPV, it's fine, continue your cytology. But if your cytology is not on already, now is not the era to establish new cytology labs. Then either you can start straight away with HPV and if you have the super uh, tertiary centers, you can even have the genotyping, you can add on cytology as a triage. If you don't have, you can do VIA to see these HPV positive women, do they have a lesion? But if you can't do HPV, do the VIA alone by which so ever test you have anything positive. Colposcopy is the way by which we look at the cervix under magnification and look for lesions. We ideally should take the biopsy, get the report and manage accordingly. But the best thing being recommended by WHO and our health ministry is try as far as possible to do it at the same sitting if it meets the criteria, follow the screen and treat approach if you are doing the VIA, if you have the colposcopy, do the C and treat, colposcopy and treat approach, and then they will not be lost to follow up. So we all know that pap smear was the one which reduced the mortality by 70%. See, this was long back, we have known this now, that by doing pap smear at regular three to five yearly intervals, the mortality decreased, the incidence increased because in C2 incidence increased. And George Papanikolaou has been honored time and again, although he missed the Nobel because they didn't give it jointly in those days. And by the time his turn came, he passed away and they didn't give posthumous so. But the funny part is that though cytology has saved so many lives, it's actually a very poor sensitivity test. And this is not data from any developing world, but from Europe and North America, meta-analysis of studies showed that the sensitivity to de detect high-grade CIN was just around 60%, 55 to 60%. And so the reason it has been successful is when you do it again and again, you know the natural history is long, you detect it in pre-invasive and treat it. But if you have to do a single test, HPV is more uh, superior because it will detect more than 95% of cases who have the infection with this virus. And this is from the same meta-analysis, the cytology here, the HPV behind, and no matter which age group you look at, 
whether you look at CIN3+, which is the true precursor lesion, or you look at CIN2+, so all these are high-grade lesions, but it is HPV who is far better, far better than cytology and sensitivity. Now, because it was not possible to do cytology for us, no labs, no trained people, no, no money for it, there came the concept of VI. Visual inspection one minute after application of 5% acetic acid. And for Lugol's, it's not one minute. Instantly after applying, you can see which takes, which doesn't take. Now, the beauty of this was that the sensitivity was as good or even better than PAP, even better than many studies. And it can be trained to taught to anybody, even the health worker. And you get the results immediately. So you can see if they can have a screen and treat approach. But the poor specificity was the problem. Many women with immature metaplasia will start showing this whiteness. So large number of false positives need to be referred and where do they go for that reference? Then the quality, training and retraining because it is very subjective. And I explained to you, we should be able to see the whole transformation zone, but this is not possible in menopausal women. Why? Because the uh, squamocolumna junction recedes into the endocervical canal. And therefore, this, though it showed in research setting that it could reduce the mortality but it needed the intensive follow-up and management to bring about this 31% in one study, 35% reduction. Nevertheless, because it is the only practical one, Tamil Nadu was the first state, started with two districts, scaled up. Same model was expanded to the country. And we have this national program and it gives the outline how to do the VI negative, come back in five years, positive, refer to the gynecologist, lesions eligible for cryotherapy, they have specified it, not more than two quadrant entirely on ectocervix, not in vagina, not in endocervix, can be seen totally, can be covered by largest available cryotherapy probe and no suspicion on invasive cancer. You can treat right away. And in fact, this is for cryotherapy, but if it is thermal ablation, you can even do the overlapping probes. But if they have any symptoms like postcoital bleeding, postmenopausal bleeding, or it looks irregular, there's a prop growth, bleeds on touch, then no, then no immediate treatment. They must be sent for the colposcopy and then it should be done based on whether it is CIN1, you can do ablation two or three, if it's suitable for leap or cone, and if it's frank cancer, then go to the cancer center. So this program is now in 200 districts in the country, but the, uh, the screening of cervix is lagging. Almost seven and a half crores women have been screened for oral and breast, but only one and a half crores for cervix and then the secondary linkages are lacking. That is where HPV scores. And you know that Harold Zurhausen got the Nobel Prize for his discovery. And this is a very important statement which all PGs should know. Persistent high-risk HPV infection is the necessary cause of cervical cancer. So there are many, many types of HPV. There are about 13, 14 types which are oncogenic, which we call high risk. And it is persistent infection with them, which is necessary, but not sufficient. Other factors are needed. Everyone will not go on to cervical cancer. 90% will clear the infection. So, but without this infection, it will almost never occur. And it's a very high association. We all accept the association of smoking and lung cancer. This is a tenfold risk with the hepatitis virus, depending on the type, it's a 20 to 50 fold risk for liver cancer. But look at HPV risk for cervical cancer. So there is no doubt about its importance. So now this looks a little complicated, but I will just show you how when you combine the cytology and HPV testing, you can actually stratify the risk. Now here is the risk of pre-cancer and here is the type of screening. And we know cytology negative have a very low risk Then ASCUS and LCIL are more and HCIL is the highest. That's why all HCIL are treated. 
But if the HPV negative ascus is there, look how the risk is almost just little more than cytology, whereas the HPV positive ascus is actually like an LCIL. So that is where you can use this data to do the co-testing. And it was difficult for people to stop pap smears. But when they followed up these women, they found that although cytology negative women eventually in six years, not very many, but they had a risk of developing, but the risk was much less in the HPV negative and there was only marginal difference if you did both. This type of data informed the change to primary HPV testing as well as to increase the interval of screening because not many women are going to get again between, you know, by the uh, five years once they are negative at baseline. So these sort of things have been very important. And these type of data for 16, 18, you see if you are HPV 16 positive or HPV 18 positive, a far greater risk of developing CIN3 or cancer over 10 year time compared to the other high risk HPV types or the HPV negative, only one little difference. These are women under 13, these are women uh, 30 over 30. But usually HPV testing is recommended over 30 years because a lot of younger women will have the infection, which as I mentioned, 90% will spontaneously clear it. And the other thing is that as we get more and more girls getting vaccinated with HPV vaccine, post-vaccination HPV will be the better test because already cytology is poor, and as there are fewer and fewer lesions, there will be less accuracy of the cytopathologists to detect it. Now, this was a landmark study which showed that HPV testing can work in rural India also by Dr. Shankar, which comes single round of HPV testing with cytology, VIA, and a control group who was just given the awareness and where to go type of advice, which was the standard of care at the time. And as the years went by, the cumulative instance of stage two or worse cancers was much lower in the HPV group as compared to the cytology VIA control group, also the mortality. And very interestingly, if you looked at the women who were negative, there were far fewer ones who were negative by HPV test who developed cancer over time as compared to those who had been negative by cytology or BI. So it was very clear that this was the ultimate goal for us, but because of the affordability availability, we were still with BI. So coming back to our FOXI GCPR, we have two settings, good resource and limited resource settings. And we can decide, depending we are sitting in a tertiary center or we're doing a camp someday, what are the modalities available to us? Accordingly, we start at 25 in good resource and at 13 limited resource, because there are very few cases before 13 does not justify screening everybody. Moreover, you may make them anxious by detecting some minor lesions. So let us not start at any cost before 25 and mainly emphasize after 30. And then it also tells you how you can do the single visit approach in these settings and what would be your management options, which are very variable for everyone. What we are now looking for as point of care affordable tests, which will be uh, quick as well. The care HPV is available and I know many people are using it, but it still is a batch test. So first you have to spend time collecting the batch and then it still takes about two and a half hours. Gene Expert and TrueNAT are proving to be very exciting because this platform is widely available for TB testing. They are making the cartridges for HPV testing and they are still expensive, but they are for one person, takes about 35 minutes for the actual test when about an hour everything is done. And uh, we hope that this will materialize. And there is work going on to develop a strip test, which will be like a pregnancy test, which will be fantastic. And this has been shown in modeling studies also, how the one visit strategy will be very good. I will not pause, but I want to emphasize this to all my PGs today 
Screening alone will not save life. Treatment of the screen detected lesions is essential. And you can do a visual assessment for treatment if you have done an HPV test also or a colposcopy and treat. And you have now portable colposcopes, portable thermal ablators, which are battery powered. And you can take them to last mile facilities or teach your health workers to capture and transmit images. Or there is now coming the incorporation of AI for diagnosis. This is Serva, which we are developing at Ames, which will be a combined colposcope and thermal ablator in one affordable testing. And the images you get with these are really, really good. This is the pocket colposcope Duke University has developed. They are shortly going to market. You can see the fantastic images you get by going close. Moreover, when you use the Swede, you can change the setting. At a setting of Swede score five, you have 100% sensitivity. But at Swede score eight, it is 97% specificity. What does this mean? This means that if at eight sweet score, you treat immediately, whether you do leap or whatever, chances of over-treatment are very little. So at five, you can pick up all the high grade. And if at eight, you choose to treat right away, you will not miss the lesion. Self-sampling is a big advantage of HPV testing. It is for the hard to reach women, the shy woman who wants privacy, doesn't come. It's a very good way to go. Again, this large study showed that if you uh, uh, enable the community health workers to go out and collect the self samples, it's a fourfold increase in the screening uptake. And we found that 98% women could provide a satisfactory self-sample by showing this chart translated into the local language and 94% concordance between the self and provider collected samples. So WHO first said that these are what are they called best buys, huh? the effective interventions with cost effectiveness analysis. They said vaccinate the girls with two doses, nine to 13 year old HPV and cervical cancer screening 30 to 49 through any of the three tests. Of course, the timing and the uh, interval will vary. But now WHO has rolled out the uh, commitment to eliminate cervical cancer 17th November. Many of you participated, lit up your hospitals in Teal. Howrah Bridge got lit up in Teal. It was an exciting day. Now the targets have shifted a little bit. They say screen 70% with an HPV test at 35 and 45 years of age and make sure that 90% of these women get treated. And in fact, the modeling shows that it would remain status quo with no intervention. It would decline remarkably with the girls only vaccination. But if you can add Life, once in lifetime screening even and cancer treatment, you will move this elimination target forward by so many years. So Dr. Purandre said when he was FIGO president, I was chairing the FIGO Oncology Committee and he organized a side uh, event when Dr. Tedros launched this. And he said too often women who are now being saved by the reduction in mortal maternal mortality are dying instead from cervical cancer, a preventive disease. So to bring my last slide, yes, we can do 70% coverage. If we expand the coverage, include other cadres of health workers, outreach to the last mile facilities with a single visit approach, solutions for tracking and follow up. So thank you very much. If there are any questions, please put them on the chat box and I will be happy to answer them and do vote for me in the next election, all of you who are eligible for Foxy Vice President and give me a chance to serve again. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Neeraja. It was an excellent presentation. Hello. Hello. Yes, we can hear you, Dr. Uh, it was an excellent presentation. I am sure that our postgraduates are very much benefited by your presentation. Now, we know that CSR is a preventable condition, so that is why the screening of CSR is, is very important. And recently, in 2020, even American Cancer Society has come up with the screening guidelines again. I am sure that there will be a lot of questions. I am 
at putting uh, the questions in the chat box i think undas i uh, have not seen any questions so far yeah because of lack of time ma'am we will be doing the questions if the if uh, questions in the chat box will be transferred here if time okay. permits otherwise we will just go like this ma'am because time is short and uh, and uh, thank you dr neeraj once again thank you very much okay so having seen hello okay having discussed the effective protocols for a very preventable disease we now move over to the next topic uh, by dr amita maheshwari it's my pleasure to invite madam she is professor and head division of gynecologic oncology tata memorial center mumbai madam will be talking to us on staging and management of csr it's over to you madam hello Amita madam Dr Amita can you share your screen Hello. Hello. We can hear you. Yeah, yeah. You're audible. So, despite checking, I don't know why you know technology fails me every time. Uh, so, very good afternoon, and at the outset, my sincere thanks to the organizers of the CME and Foxy, especially Dr. Bhagya Lakshmi and I, Dr. Anita Singh and Dr. Alpesh Gandhi, for this opportunity. uh so in next 15 minutes i'll give you an overview on the staging and management of cervical cancer and um, dr bhagya lakshmi has requested me to show a small video on a radical hysterectomy so just to put things in perspective perspective a multi paris women with irregular vaginal bleeding uh found to have around 3.5 cm ulcer ulcero proliferative cervical growth on examination vagina and bilateral para work so the question is uh, the biopsy confirm the diagnosis of a squamous cell carcinoma so the question is how do we stage this patient and what is the further management you know what should be the further management plan for her so um staging for cervical cancer is i think one of the oldest uh, cancer to be staged and it was uh, done first for the first time way back in 1929 and since then many revisions have happened to this staging and the most recent is uh, figo 2018 uh, staging so i'm sure you all aware of this uh, old staging 2000 uh, uh, nine staging and modifications have been done um, to this staging and i will tell you why these modifications were required so the revised staging um, was uh, uh, under the leadership of dr neerja batla as president of uh, figo oncology committee Uh, so what are important um, features of this new staging so uh, continues to have four stages uh, so stage 1a which is microscopic uh, carcinoma confined to the so now stage 1a which was uh, you know it's subdivided into stage 1a 1 and 1a 2 like previously the only uh, change has happened that the horizontal spread of 7 mm has been removed so now you just have to uh, you know one may, may, uh, one uh, parameter to uh, decide stage 1a 1 and 1a 2 that is depth of stromal involvement from the basement so it up to 3 mm depth it is stage 1a 1 and between 5 mm it is stage 1a 2 so more than 3 up to 5 is stage 1a 2 uh stage 1b uh, instead of two sub stages you have three now so 1b 1 is uh, micro you know any invasive cancer confined to cervix more than stage 1a2 that means the depth of stromal invasion is more than 5 mm but size is limit up to 2 cm that is stage b 1b1 uh 1b2 is more than 2 cm up to 4 cm uh, that's a greatest tumor dimension and 1b3 is more than 4 cm 
uh, stage two is essentially unchanged. Uh, so two A like uh, before has two A one and two A two. Uh, that's based on tumor size with involvement of of up only up to upper two third of vagina, and stage two B is medial parametrial involvement. Uh, stage three has uh, undergone major changes. So this is uh, stage one and two. Uh, coming to stage three. Uh, so three A and three B uh, remain the same, but there is addition of stage three C and that includes lymph node uh, involvement. So stage 3C is further subdivided into 3C1 if pelvic nodes are involved and 3C2 if nodal spread has gone up to uh, paraortic region. Now, as we understand, not every patient will have a histological confirmation of nodal metastasis because majority patients with locally advanced disease are not suitable for surgery. So in a large proportion of patients, this nodal involvement is based on radiology. So to further distinguish between radiology-based nodal involvement from pathology-based, you have two uh, you know, uh, uh, suffix, like uh, if it is radiology, it will be stage 3R, and if it is also pathology, then it is 3CP. Uh, so that's important uh, because it will tell how these nodes were. Uh, uh, picked up either on radiology or pathology confirmation was done. Uh, stage four uh, remains unchanged. So four A is involvement to adjacent organs, especially bladder and bowel, and four B is distant metastasis. So this is in nutshell uh, about the re revised FIGO staging. Uh, now coming to that question, because radiology has become very important in revised staging. But what uh, you know, Figo realized that um, you know, cervical cancer is is a disease of uh, developing countries, and not everywhere you have all facilities for imaging facilities. So it gives a liberty to decide which imaging you want to do, and whether histopathology or surgical staging uh, you wish to do or not. So it's not mandatory. Uh, to do histopathological confirmation of metastatic lymph nodes in every patient and imaging modality. Also, there is uh, flexibility based on uh, resources um, at local place. So the important question is, what is the optimum pretreatment imaging? So chest radiograph is mandatory, but coming to abdominal pelvic imaging, based on what facilities you have, you can do either a sonography or a CECT scan or MRI. Now, if you, uh, you know, if you want to know uh, primary tumor characteristics, especially tumor size, depth of cervical stromal invasion, parametrial spread and vaginal involvement, MRI is the be best modality. Uh, as far as lymph node pickup is concerned, both CECT and MRI have similar pickup. So there is no, uh, you know, uh, both modalities have uh, similar sensitivity rates there. Uh, PET CT is maybe useful in advanced cases, but in early stage disease, PET CT has shown to have low sensitivity for nodal pickup and is not recommended as a routine. So only in advanced stages, uh, based on institutional practice, you may do a PET CT scan, but it's not mandatory to do PET CT for all cases. So coming back to our case, uh, a lady with cervical growth, histology of uh, uh, squamous cell carcinoma, we did MRI, which showed a 3.8 into 3.2 centimeter cervical mass, which has superficial stromal invasion, para vagina uh, were free, there were no lymph nodes. So if you have two stage, it is FIGO stage 1B2, as per FIGO uh, 2008 aging system. And the next question is, what treatment you, would, you will uh, offer to this patient? So let me tell you a little you know, overview on how, how we decide treatment of a patient with cervical cancer. So all patients, all stages of cervical cancer, right from stage 1A to stage 4A can be treated with radiation therapy. And 1B3 onwards, we add concurrent chemo radiation. And radiation is generally a combination of external beam radiation that is given by teletherapy and brachytherapy. 
However, surgery is feasible only in patients who have early stage disease that is confined to the cervix and uh, or with minimum vaginal involvement. So all other patients are not offered surgery. And even in early stage patients, studies have shown that surgery and radiation uh, give similar results. So a patient with early stage disease, if not suitable for surgery or not willing uh, for surgery, can equally well treat it with radiation therapy with similar survival outcomes. But uh, surgery definitely has many advantages over radiation. So it is the modality of choice whenever uh, a patient is suitable for surgery. Uh, so what are the advantages of surgery over radiation? It gives tissue for histopathologic examination and you get to know accurate extent of that disease, especially with revised FIGO staging. I think it is, you know, uh, you may think that patient has cervix confined disease, but if lymph nodes turn out to be positive from stage one, it moves to stage three C disease. Uh, complications of surgery are acute and easy to manage as opposed to radiation complications, which are uh, very hard to treat and chronic and may appear, you know, many, many years after uh, the primary treatment. Ovarian function preservation is possible at surgery and better sexual quality of life after surgery. So these are the advantages of surgery over radiation. And a patient who is fit and willing to undergo surgery um, is uh, offered surgical treatment. But one point uh, very important to remember that not in every patient surgery alone be adequate. After a wonderful surgery, what you need to see a number of histopathological factors, which includes lymph node metastasis, present or absent, the disease in parametria, surgical margins, depth of stromal invasion, lymph vascular space invasion and tumor size. So why all these are important? Because based on the presence or of absence of these risk factors, patients are divided into uh, three risk categories. So patients who have either lymph node positive or disease in para or margin positive, these patients have very high risk of recurrence by surgery alone, and therefore they are given adjuvant chemo radiation. So eventually this patient, we would receive a radical surgery and radical radiation along with chemotherapy. So you have to uh, treat them with three modalities. Patients who have intermediate risk, that is tumor size more than four centimeter, that means 1B3 disease, presence of deep stromal invasion and lymph vascular space positive. So any two out of three, uh, there is a risk of relapse and with, you know, by surgery alone. Uh, so these patients are given adjuvant pelvic radiation. So two out of three, if risk factors are present, then uh, patients are, uh, you know, uh, they, they are treated with adjuvant pelvic radiation. All other patients are okay to be under observation. So this is important to remember that surgery alone may not be adequate in every patient of early stage disease. And this brings me to a very important principle of treatment, and that is either radical radiotherapy with concurrent chemotherapy now, or radical surgery should be used as far as possible. So when you select patient for surgery, your primary goal should be that surgery should be alone adequate to this, you know, to treat the patient. Of course, based on final histopathology risk factors, you some patients would require, but, you know, do not subject patients to surgery and thinking that then after surgery, somehow let's remove the uh, uterus and then give them radiation. No, that's not the correct approach. The idea is to just... Uh, them either with radical hysterectomy or radical radiation with chemotherapy. So that's the principle of treatment. So do not do surgery if you think patient would require adjuvant radiation. Of course, some would end up getting radiation, but that should not be your uh, primary aim. And uh, for this reason, there is a controversy about you know stage 1B3 disease because these patients already have one or two risk factors to start with. So the question is whether we should uh, offer them surgery at all or uh, give treat with concurrent chemoradiation. So in the West, uh, um, most patients with stage 
1B3 and beyond, they are treated with concurrent chemo radiation. And that's the uh, policy we also follow at our center. But maybe a rare patient, you know, maybe may offer surgery. So these are generally young patients who are fit uh, for surgery. There is no lymphadenopathy on preoperative imaging, especially if it's adenocarcinoma. Although there is not good evidence that adenocarcinoma is less radiation sensitive, but some studies have shown that uh, adenocarcinoma is better with surgery. And of course, uh, in our country, we have to see availability of infrastructure. But by and large, tumors more than four centimeters confined to cervix are also treated with concurrent chemo radiation. The next question is, what should be the extent of surgery? So if you are wondering that we are doing surgery only for cervix confined disease, why we want to do such a radical kind of surgery? The answer is a radical hysterectomy is based on basic Holstadian principle of oncological surgery. That means you remove tumor along with healthy margin all around the tissue, all, all around the primary tumor. So when we talk about cervical cancer, margins, upper margin is body of the uterus. On lateral sides, you have all paracervical or parametrial tissue and the lower margin is vagina. So that's why you need to do a radical hysterectomy for disease which is confined to the cervix and along with also need to remove draining lymph nodes. So uh, you can tailor surgery a little bit based on the stage of disease. So if it is stage 1A1 disease, it's class 1 or simple extra facial hysterectomy is good. Uh, if, if fertility preservation is required, a radical trachelectomy or a radical cone can also uh, 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 be adequate. It's a 1A2 disease, uh, then, you know, class 2 or modify radical hysterectomy and, or radical trachelectomy if fertility is a concern. But if it is larger tumor, um, classical class 3 radical hysterectomy with bilateral pelvic lymph node dissection is the standard treatment. However, fertility preservation is possible in women who have less than two centimeter lesion and fulfill other criteria. So this is just to show what do we mean by these three classes. Actually, you have a PIVAS uh, classification system, which uh, classifies radical hysterectomy into five classes, but the most commonly used are th first three classes. And now we have uh, another system, which is uh, a curlo moro system, which is more anatomical uh, and more objective than PIVAS system. But just I think for PG, uh, PIVAS system is also good. So uh, every, you know, classes, there is increased amount of paracervical tissue, which is removed as the class uh, increases. And also the amount of vagina removed with uh, uh, in the specimen. So this is uh, in real life. So this is class one. When you apply clamps close to the cervix, you just remove uh, cervix completely. That's class one or extra facial simple hysterectomy. Class two, medial uh, parametria, that is uterosacral and cardinal ligaments uh, are removed. And this is class three, where you take all these ligaments close to lateral pelvic wall. And of course, a very uh, important and essential component of surgery is lymphadenectomy. And lymphadenectomy should be a detailed removal of all lymph node bearing tissues from all sides of uh, blood vessels. Uh, just removing few fat globules does not uh, constitute a lymphadenectomy. So with this kind of uh, surgery, five-year survival for uh, uh, early stage cervical cancer is excellent, more than 85%. Because there can be complications. I think this is important for uh, PG students to know complications of radical hysterectomy. So complications can be divided intraoperative and postoperative. Intraoperative, the most common is injury to blood vessel leading to hemorrhage. Generally, uh, venous bleeding is more common than, uh, than arterial. And internal iliac veins are, you know, tributaries of internal iliac veins can easily get traumatized during a radical hysterectomy. There can be injuries to other important structures, including ureter, bladder, bowel, and nerves. So the way, best way is to follow oncological principles and recognize and repair them intraoperatively. Early postoperative complications include uh, fever, urinary tract infection, DVT, pulmonary embolism, uh, facial deformation, pelvic abscess, wound infection, burst abdomen, and chest complications. These are some of common complications which 
one may encounter during uh, early post operative period and late complications are uh, related to autonomic nerve injuries because autonomic nerves which supply to bladder and bowel are they run in very close proximity of uterosacral and cardinal ligaments uh, and they get injured during uh, 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 a radical surgery so this can lead to bladder bowel and sexual dysfunctions and lymphadenectomy is associated with may be associated with lymphedema so there are ways how we can reduce these uh, complications i think in the interest of time i will not show you in detail but uh, so to reduce uh, autonomic nerve injury related complication one uh, can do nerve sparing radical hysterectomy or tailored hysterectomy based on the extent of uh, uh, involvement and for lymphedema uh, can do sentinel lymph node in selected cases so there are indications and in how we can you know how to select cases for sentinel lymph node so that's beyond uh, i think um, the, the discussion uh, today uh, so with this i will i think uh, and my theory part i'll show you a video on type 3 radical hysterectomy the same patient i started with so you know now she has stage 1b2 disease and she was fit and willing for surgery so abdomen is entered through midline vertical incision alternatively you can take a transverse incision also malar journeys or fenestil the first step especially for a anterior cervical lip lesion could be mobilization of bladder because really it may be densely stuck uh, to the cervix and it may make the case inoperable. The next step is to uh, enter the retroperitoneum. So this is on the right side. You enter retroperitoneum by incising peritoneum between the round ligament and infundibular pelvic ligament. And once you do that, what you see from lateral to medial side, uh, down is uh, uh, head end of the patient. So what you are seeing the red structure here is iliosoas muscle. This is external iliac artery and external iliac vein. So continue dissection in this loose areolar tissue. Uh, dissection should be very, very deliberate. Uh, avoid blunt dissection as far as possible. Be very deliberate, gentle. I'm using uh, pottery. So that's... Okay, so what... Uh, we have done now, we have entered the retroperitoneum and the first step is to develop paravesical space, okay? So paravesical space bordered medially by uh, bladder and paravesical fat, anteriorly is bony pu uh, pubic bone, laterally is obturator internus muscle and posterior is anterior surface of cardinal ligament. I want you to appreciate the presence of loose areolar tissue and at the base is levator muscle or pelvic diaphragm. Now you start with lymph node dissection. So start at the level of mid common iliac. I think you can appreciate the bifurcation of common iliac. On the right side, uh, common iliac vein is lateral to the artery. So take care not to injure. The white structure which is running over psoas here is a genitofemoral nerve. So when removing lymph nodes from external iliac uh, vessel artery, uh, take care not to injure genitofemoral nerve, which runs parallel and just lateral to the artery. So white structure there is genitofemoral nerve. And the red or pinkish thing is uh, external iliac artery and the blue is external. So as I said, all lymph node bearing air tissue from all sides of vessel should come out. It's just not picking up two uh, nodes. So if there are nodes between uh, iliac ar ar arteries, uh, artery and vein, that should also uh, come out. Now the next is obturator group of nodes. So this is obturator fossa. Now by structure, there is obturator nerve. Again, take care not to injure the nerve. This is uh, uh, one of the common, not so common, but one of the complications of uh, lymphadenectomy, injury to obturator nerve and obturator vein and artery are below the nerve. So the relation here is nerve, artery, and vein. So after lymphadenectomy, you will be able to see some of the branches of internal iliac artery. So this is internal iliac artery. It continues uh, lower down as uh, uh, obliterated umbilical artery. The next step is ligation of uterine artery at its origin. So how we identify uterine generally is the first branch of anterior division of internal iliac. 
and it runs uh, over the ureter and it runs transversely. So that's how you identify and it has taught your score. So you will have a descending branch from uterine um, at the level of os, it gives a descending branch and the main uh, artery, it um, ascends in parametria. The next step is mobilization of ureter from its attachment to the posterior leaf of broad ligament. Again, if you are using cautery, take care uh, not to injure the ureter, not to touch the ureter, and maintain blood supply to the ureter, which runs again parallel in adventitia or in, in of, to the ureter. So this is vessel not to damage it. So this lady. Uh, was 45, so there was uh, no role of ovarian uh, preservation, but in a young patient, ovaries can be preserved. Uh, this is ligation of infundibular pelvic ligament. After that, you cut the posterior leaf of broad ligament all the way to sacral ligament and develop pararectal space at this point. So ureter is being retracted, and what you are seeing is pararectal space. The lateral part will identify hypo. Fibers can get injured when you do radical hysterectomy. You know, if you want to do blunt dissection, as I said, you have to be very deliberate and go in loose areolar tissue. Uh, only when you can see this is another way to approach obturator lymph nodes. So you retract vessels medially and then uh, go from lateral side. So externals are retracted medially, and then you can approach obturator fossa from lateral side. This is obturator nerve. This is to tell you not to confuse obturator artery with uterine artery. Obturator runs laterally, uterine is medial. Again, uh, ligation of uterine on the left side. Now, why we ligate uterine is uh, with the idea is, uh, you know, that whatever lymphatics which is running along the vessels is uh, removed in the specimen. So that's why paracervical tissue uh, is removed and uterine is one of the components. Um, this is the development of pararectal space on the left side. So coming to posterior uh, section between cervix and vagina anteriorly and rectum posteriorly. So pouch of Douglas peritoneum is incised. Now, unlike uh, simple hysterectomy here, you plan to remove uterosacral and cardinal ligaments. So you need to mobilize the rectum uh, quite, uh, you know, extensively from the, um, in the rectovaginal septum and from the, away from the cervix. So, an important point here is to keep fat with the rectum. That will give you a safe plane. So here it's rectovaginal septum. And then is uh, you two sacral ligaments are <laughs> Keep fat with the rectum, retract the rectum away from the vagina. And what you have at the end is uterosacral ligament. I will say it's a classical type 3 radical hysterectomy. This is the entire uterosacral ligament. Again, further. So it's ligated right at the uh, close to the sacrum and rectum. Uh, you can use some energy device like Legashore or Harmonic. So on the other side, uh, just demonstrating how like a shot can be used. So this is sacrum and the entire uterosacral is removed. This is transverse cervical or cardinal ligament. Again, you can appreciate how close to the lateral pelvic wall it was ligated. Uh, so last bit is anterior dissection. This is anterior leaf of the ureteric tunnel. You may have to further uh, do dissection in uh, the psycho cervical fascia. This is uh, utero vesical ligament. You can be very careful when using any energy source in this area. And the last bit is paracolpium. So, how much vagina to uh, be removed? It's uh, if it's a state, cervix confined disease, no vaginal involvement. 
two to three centimeter of vagina is good. You don't have to remove upper two third of vagina, even in a class three radical hysterectomy. So that's why I suggest you read uh, Murlo, uh, Moro, uh, Kurlo Moro's classification, which is a uh, little more anatomical than the conventional fibers classification. So at the end, uh, make a vaginal cut. So we do not routinely do preoperative colposcopy for all patients, but if there is any concern about vaginal involvement, even by C, uh, you know intraepithelial lesion, I think it's a good idea to do a colposcopy and make sure that uh, you get uh, negative margins. So look for any inadvertent injury at the end, and if all good, then put bubble in an atmical position. Uh, we prefer putting drains for a couple of days, generally for two, three days. This is the specimen. So this is the central tumor and you can appreciate the uh, cervical, paracervical tissue. And we do give antibiotics and DVT prophylaxis to all our patients. So with this, I will end my talk. Thank you very much for the opportunity. Thank you. So, yeah. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am, for that uh, crisp presentation and a wonderful video. Uh, just one clarification. Uh, you had uh, see the general impression is that uh, with uh, more sophisticated uh, imaging modality, the better will be the pickup of the disease. But you said you mentioned that uh, in early disease, uh, the MRI is still more sensitive than the PET CT. So is it that uh, for early disease, you advocate MRI and for advanced disease, a PET would work better? Or is it only MRI? Uh, so for advanced, see advanced disease, it depends on your radiation oncologist. If they want to do, it's a little complex uh, topic, but if they want to do MRI based planning, they generally prefer doing a MRI uh, because now planning can be done based or radiation planning can be done based on CECT. Some centers do use PET for lymph node mapping and some use MRI for radiation, radiation uh, treatment. So uh, at our center, uh, we either do a CECT or uh, MRI for even for advanced stages. So it is, I think, quite institutional practice. Uh, I did a study actually looking at the uh, role of PET-CT in early stage cervical cancer. And we found that PET-CT actually doesn't add to CECT in early stage as far as lymph node uh, pickup is concerned. And I think the reason is um, uh, most cases with early stage lymph node metastasis are micromets. So these micromets are not picked up by PET CT. Uh, they can be just seen on histology. So that's why I think PET CT uh, fails in early stages, but in advanced it has shown to have some uh, use, especially when you plan uh, uh, the radiation field, if you want to extend to paraortic region, or if you are suspecting distant metastasis to mediastinum or uh, lymph nodes or lungs. So there, I think it has some role, but we don't routinely use PET-CT. And I just want to, uh, before I just think, uh, I don't know if I'm, I'm there. So at the end, you know, it's a teamwork. Oncology is not one person's um, uh, jobs. You have have to have developed uh, a med medical radiation oncologist, surgical pathologist, along with uh, surgical, uh, you know, surgical speciality. You can't work in isolation. You have to have uh, all your colleagues equally competent and equally willing to uh, share the responsibility. Then only you can deliver the best to the patients. Okay, thank you, ma'am. It was a pleasure listening to you. Thank you very much for the opportunity. Madam, please uh, stop sharing the screen, please, madam. Hello. Hello. You're Hello. audible, ma'am. You're audible. Oh. Yeah. After hearing about the screening of CA service and sharing and surgical management of CA service, now we will go to the role of radiotherapy in CA service. The speaker is Professor B. Prasanam Mari, madam. Madam is the former professor of OBG Medical College of Thiruvananthapuram and now working as consultant in OBG in uh, Lifeline Hospital, Adu. Adu is the author of the new book, Postgraduate in Gynecology, where the foreword is written by none other than Professor Arul Kumar. Now, Madam was the uh, past president of KFO and was awarded WHO Fellowship in 1991. Over to you, Madam, for your presentation on the role of 
radiotherapy in CSRIs. Thank you, Chalama. Thank you, Perindalmanna um, Society, for inviting me for this um, class. And uh, welcome, uh, my dear postgraduates. Shall I share my screen? Yes, ma'am. So after having heard about uh, the surgical management of uh, uh, cancer of the cervix, we'll move on to uh, radiation, uh, uh, radiotherapy for cancer of the cervix. Actually, um, uh, even though in spite of the uh, screening and the vaccine and uh, uh, treatment of early cancer, there's a long period of uh, a pre-invasive stay, cancer of the cervix is still uh, rampant. And it is the third most uh, common cancer in women worldwide. So it's very important to learn about the treatment of cancer of the cervix. Radium, a key element in early cancer treatment. Let us pay homage to the hard work put by uh, Madame Curie. And she was the first woman to uh, be awarded Nobel Prize. And she got Nobel Prize for uh, physics as well as chemistry. And uh, let us pay homage to Madame Curie and Perry Curie. Coming to radiotherapy, um, when, uh, after having heard about the staging and the treatment modalities, it's very, very important to counsel the patient. She should be properly counseled as to um, how to how to go about uh, with the treatment, either radiation or, uh, uh, or surgery, and what is the uh, outcome of radiation and what she is going to have uh, when she gets radiation, etc., etc. Uh, we have to uh, spend some time with the couple, with the uh, patient and the relatives. So radiotherapy, as already said, is an important treatment option for stage 1B1, one 1B2, one, one and 2A, 2A1 disease. That is the treatment option. Uh, it can be surgery or radiation, depending upon several factors. But for stage 1B3, uh, 2B, 3, and 4, 4A, Radiation is the treatment of choice. And of course, uh, after surgery uh, for uh, high risk conditions like uh, lymph vascular space invasion, uh, stromal invasion, and cut margins, etc., etc., then of course, you have to do supplement uh, um, adjuvant radiation. So, for the advantages of radiation, I treat the cervix along with the draining lymphatics and the lymph nodes and the microscopic deposits. And cure is achieved with preservation of organs. No organ is being lost. And the primary mortality is almost dim. Or even though the mortality for vertebrates also is coming down. When, uh, when surgery is contraindicated, as in the case of a um, serious heart disease, GMT positive or uh, coronary artery disease, um, then of course radiation is the treatment of choice. <clears throat> and cure can be attempted even in advanced cases. And radiation is usually given concurrently with the radio sensitizer cisplatin. <clears throat> cisplatin, 40 milligram per square meter is given um, every, for, before every uh, treatment, uh, radiation <coughs> treatment. <clears throat> when it comes to radiotherapy of cancer of the cervix, uh, the patient needs an external beam radiotherapy as well as brachytherapy. In an external beam radiotherapy, radiation to pelvic side walls and external uh, is given uh, by external beam mega voltage teletherapy with the linear accelerator. That is the latest. A common area and parioretic lymph nodes are involved. Of course, the radiation field it has to be extended beyond up to the level of the kidney. In brachytherapy, the tumor parametrum and, uh, and some of the uh, radiation is given to the pelvic side walls, of course, the uh, nodes. And, that, and the rest is covered by the external radiation. So intra, it is attacked by an intracavitary source and external radiation. So encirclement is the military term for the situation when a force is a target is isolated and surrounded by enemy forces. Exactly like that, we attack the cervix and the lymph nodes and the parametrium by inter, intracavitary as well as external radiation. And 
when it comes to <coughs> external beam radiotherapy, uh, cobalt 60 teletherapy unit is the one which is available in many of the centers. But uh, the advance is linear accelerator. Pardon? Yeah, but up close you can see. Pardon? But the advance is linear accelerator. Um, indication for the, see, usually um, uh, in the IBRT is given um, uh, initially and then followed by EBRT. But in certain situations, uh, I, EBRT definitely should be given before IBRT. Whereas uh, these are, when there is a bulky tumor, you will not be able to place the uh, intracalculatory and the ovoids in, the, in a proper way. And or when there is a parametric involvement and large necrotic tumors and the patient is bleeding, of course, and the bleeding can be arrested by EBRT. Otherwise, we uh, usually prefer IBRT before EBRT. In EBRT, the target issue is the, <clears throat> the parametric of the tumor, the lymphatics, the lymph nodes, and uh, the normal tissue should be spared. And the parietic lymph nodes uh, up to the renal vessel should be included in case there is a parietic lymphadenopathy diagnosed by MRI. Uh, if the lower one third of the vagina is involved, the inferior lymph nodes should also be uh, in the field because that is also a primary drainage area. And this external beam RT, uh, in most of the centers, even now it is cobalt 60 teletherapy machine that is uh, used and that delivers gamma rays. And it's given as anterior, posterior, posterior, anterior, and lateral fields. Based on load, body landmass, usually treatment position is supine. And three times, and see, usually it is, a, it is based on an X-ray. It's a 2D uh, programming. And three-dimensional conformational radiotherapy with linear accelerator using CT-based treatment planning is prepared uh, for EBRT nowadays. That is a recent one. It helps in better tumor coverage and better swearing of normal surrounding tissues. Linear accelerators use high energy photon beams, which give better tissue penetration along with homogeneous and precise dose delivery with better uh, sparing of skin. And that is achieved using multi leaf polymetase. And, and it's more conformational and shape the radiation as per the shape of the target. Linear accelerator with volumetric arc re technique reduces the total treatment time taken. Previously, um, the radiation treatment was you know, isolating the patient for several days and uh, this radiation also will last for several hours. So nowadays this can be, uh, this can be given um, by a smaller, uh, I mean, shorter time. And uh, intensity modulated radiation therapy is an innovation in technique. But uh, most of the centers are not using it routinely because this in, in this intensity modulated radiation therapy, uh, the source rotates and they, uh, we, when it is given to the cervix, the cervical uh, to cervix and the tumor can get uh, can change depending upon the uh, filling or emptying of the bladder and the rectum. So, hence, it's not usually recommended. But it is um, especially preferred when brachytherapy is not possible due to abnormal cervix. With the intensity moderated radiation therapy, you can even reach the tumor and the parametrium, unlike the other external beam therapy. Uh, hence, in certain situations, it, it is the choice. And the entire process is uh, computer controlled. Initial EBRT is given for five weeks, followed by multiple sessions of intracavitary brachytherapy. EBRT total dose is 40 to 45 gray in 20 to 25 fractions at a rate of 1.82 gray per day for five weeks in a week. This uh, we have to tell the patient beforehand because, and she should be impressed about the uh, need for completing the radiation course. Coming to intracavitary radiation, Radiation source is kept inside the vagina and the uterine cavity and the cervical, see the, uh, the thing is, uh, the cervical tissue is highly tolerable to high dose of radiation. It can be given, some 16,000 rats can be given to the cervix. So that is why the intracavitary sources become very popular in the treatment of cancer of the cervix and we cannot treat the ovarian malignancy by 
um, radiation because we can't give the radiation uh, some cortosan tax or above to the whole abdomen because of the risk of uh, the soft tissue, the inner bowel, the kidney, the liver, etc. So that's the advantage of having cancer uh, cervix. Um, it's uh, the physics is uh, depends on in base square law. Uh, as the uh, distance increases, the dose decreases. So you go, go near the tumor and give a larger dose so that the tumor gets a very large dose and a smaller dose is given to the neighboring structures. And the precise placement of the short range radiation sources and the iridium 192 is the source that is being used now. It's enclosed in a protecting capsule or wire into or near the tumor. A high localized radiation dose, the short range delivery is delivered to a small volume. Previously, uh, we used to give the radiation, uh, keep the radiation source in the patient and she'll be kept alone, isolated for uh, about a week. And uh, this is very tragic, you know. So this has been replaced by the uh, iridium 192 source. And of course, it spares the normal um, organs leading to less side effects. So uh, previously, it was the preloading technique where all the sources are introduced and the patient is isolated and uh, she'll be kept alone. Uh, Initially, preloaded tubes are introduced, and the disadvantage is high radiation risk to the medical and paramedical person also, and that has been overcome by the afterloading technique, where the sources are introduced into the body through applicators, and then the high uh, dose rate uh, isotope is given um, later uh, when it is uh, decided, and the radiation source in this iridium one ninety two. And uh, that's an animated video. So when you do hysterectomy, we, we say, oh, this uterus is kept in uh, between the uter bladder, ureter, rectum, and it's so difficult to do a hysterectomy. Uh, but it comes to the uh, intracavitary radiation treatment. It's an advantage that the service is centrally placed. You can put an intracavitary source and two vaginal ovoids and irradiate the cervix of the tumor maximum. So that is the source going, see the after loading, the source going into the pre-kept applicator. That is the uterine tandem and the vaginal ovoids. It can be ovoid or it can be circled. And then after treatment, the treatment uh, takes only some 10, 15 minutes. Previously, it used to be hours or days. So nowadays it has come down to some 10, 15 minutes. That is the advantage. So the afterloading technique, applicators are hollow and are made of metal. They are placed in the uterus, the uterine tandem, and the two vaginal cornices, the corpostats. They are metal tubes connected to flexible plastic tubes. You have seen in the video, it goes to the source. So it is afterloaded. Operator can load or unload radiation source in the remote housing. And if the patient wants to convey, she can press the button and uh, say, something to the uh, medical personnel. Uh, the source will retreat. After securing the connections, the computer program calculates the dose. Uh, historically, as I have said, no. Uh, the dose is calculated uh, from a two-dimensional uh, technique, X-ray. Uh, the dose prescribed to a point or for target coverage. Specified points for normal tissues on conventional radiographs. So for every patient, it is the same. Point A. Uh, Can you, uh, some connection is lost, madam. Some connection is lost. Can you share the screen, madam, once again? Madam, please share the screen. I am sharing. Yes.
I was expecting this one. So a point, as a point, uh, not a slide share. Yes, yes. Uh, the point is defined based on a 2D image. Uh, create a pear shaped high dose volume uh, field. And supposing the target is within this high dose, it's good. And if it uh, goes beyond this high dose, you do not get the prescribed dose, the dose which is necessary. That is the disadvantage of the 2D planning. Lack of information from a 2D image and no contrast of soft tissue, uncertain the geometry of both target as well as the normal tissue. So that's a disadvantage of the 2D image. So because we, uh, we cannot see the target, unique radiation dose, see here, here the uh, tumor is outside the high dose radiation uh, circle. See this part will not get the sufficient radiation. And here the fortunately the tumor is small and it will get the sufficient radiation. That is the dis exact disadvantage of the 2D image planning, the point A system. It is, uh, it's not a one fit for all. It, the, you can see the dress it will not fit both. So that, uh, that is why image guided brachytherapy key. A volumetric images we can, with volumetric images, we can see and outline the target and normal tissue. We can verify the applicator whether it's in position, um, detect whether they, we have perforated the uterus and optimize the dose, more dose to the target and less dose to the normal tissue. These images are supplied by Dr. Dinesh and Dr. Mohammed Absal from MVR Cancer Center, uh, Kerala. So uh, let me thank them. So this is the image and this is the image with the applicator. So uh, putting it in a flow chart, applicators are placed in the OT under GA and then imaging is done. The MRI machine should be available in the theater and then contouring is done. And it's a teamwork with the radiation oncologist, the medical oncologist and the radiation physicist. And the applicators are restructured and then define definition of points, not point A or B, it is the tumor and then plan. And then again, plan evaluation, probably using MRA and then dose delivery. So that is the uh, flow chart. See the planning, the target, dose not to point A, but dose to volumes. So here there's a volume of a tumor which spreads, which goes, um, which goes uh, asymmetrically like this. See, it goes asymmetrically like this. So the, this, uh, it can be planned in such a way that the, do, the dose is ma given maximum to the uh, tumor, the, to the extent of the tumor. That's the advantage of the uh, image-based uh, uh, brachytherapy. Here, you know, based on the GEC ASTRO recommendation 2016, the dose and volume parameters for prescribing, recording, reporting, they have placed the recommendations. It is some 260 pages brachytherapy alone and combined with external beam radiotherapy. Here, you know, we have give, they have given the three shades. This is the maximum dose, this is medium dose, this is the uh, minimum dose. See, they will calculate the dose to the bladder and the rectum and the sigmoid, that is the tumor. And this is the intracavitary resource and that is the vaginal ovoids. And here, uh, the parametrium on the right side is uh, more involved. See, it's involved more. Here it is less. So the field can be asymmetric. So if it is based on a 3D image, the field can be asymmetric. So that the correct dose is given to the correct tissues. That's the advantage of the 3D imaging. So um, here, you know, first uh, we see that the bladder is uh, getting more radiation, you know. It comes under the uh, pink uh, or red uh, light. And here it is corrected. Here it is corrected and uh, uh, bladder is saved. And here, you know, the tumor is yeah, yeah. And that is... Am I audible, Chalama? Yes, yes, madam. Continue. 
So it is uh, this is asymmetrical and uh, it covers the tumor completely. And uh, this is the tandem in the uterus and this is the vaginal ovoids. And uh, and the latest is uh, interstitial needles. It's a new path for radiation suits. Uh, here, you know, we can use applicate application. It is uh, named this you could say the nebulite Vienna. And these are placed in the vulva. And uh, under anesthesia, the radium will uh, it will be the radiation will be given through needles inserted into the tumor through the perineum, especially when the vagina is involved. So it can be placed, it can be placed at uh, uh, different uh, places in the tumor so that it is more conformal. It's more conformal, it's given to the uh, uh, tumor uh, alone and the tumor is getting the maximum dose. And that is the greatest innovation technique. And in developed countries, they give routinely interstitial needles. And uh, I think uh, MBR Cancer Center has started giving uh, interstitial uh, uh, radiotherapy. That is the latest innovation technique. And the challenges with the three-dimensional uh, therapy is the cost of software, hardware needed to perform the treatment planning. Initial software is very expensive and the increased use of expensive imaging techniques. And in the theater, when the uh, radium, uh, the, usually the, the applicators are being placed, MRA should be available. And dosimetric uncertainties, both inter and intra fractionally. Uh, every fraction you have to replan or, or re-image. Otherwise there can be anatomic variation, there can be shrinkage of tissues, there can be filling the bladder, emptying the bladder, filling the rectum, emptying the rectum. That is the uncertainties along with this image guided. Coming to the complications generally of uh, following radiation, there can be abdominal cramps, bleeding per rectum, diarrhea, uh, increased frequency of maturation, hematuria. There can be hematuria without a bladder uh, uh, secondary. So all these should be counseled. The patient should be counseled that these are all, this all can happen. And uh, if the rectum and vagina are involved, then of course, uh, after radiation, she can go in for a fistula. And small intestinal injury and adherent are leading to malnutrition and urethral strictures. To conclude, radiation therapy is an option for carcinoma of stage 1, B1, 1, B2, 2A1, and also adjuvant radiation. Radiation is the treatment for 1, B3, 2, 3, and 4A. The tumor, the parametrium, and the pelvic side walls are irradiated by intracavitary source, but ideally by image-guided brachytherapy, uh, MRA-guided. Radiation to the pelvic side walls parametrium uh, should be supplemented by external beam radiotherapy. Presently, EBRT is done using linear accelerator. And I think I have uh, uh, given it in a nutshell. Thank you, madam. Thank you, madam, for that excellent presentation with different types of radiotherapy methods, including the animated video. I thought I am hearing from a radiotherapy specialist. It was, management. It was, it was applied by MBR Cancer Center, uh, Dr. Dinesh. That is I, had that, I had that presentation earlier last uh -huh. week. And nowadays, what we are doing is, if you see the late stages of CR service, we straight away uh, refer the patient to radiotherapy unit. But as the gynecologist, I think we should know about the different types of radiotherapy, radiation methods, and how, at least for counseling the patient. So I think all the postgraduates will be very much uh, benefited by this talk. And thank this you much the postgraduates should know. This much yes. the PGs should know. Thank um, you very much. Last, uh, last, uh, one system. The latest uh, literature on IMRT says uh, it is also the one which minimizes complications to the bladder, intestines, etc. But uh, As I told you, you know, uh, you can precisely uh, uh, give the radiation without uh, re maximum reduction to the bladder right. and the uh, But somehow uh, you, uh, you say it is not recommended for CA cervix, right? No, no, no. Yeah. 
what I said, it is recommended for CA surveys. Okay. So I, thank you very much. I, I usually give uh, Dr. Neeraja, Dr. Amita Maheshwari, uh, Professor Nuhari, Madam, and we are uh, one hour behind the schedule. So I think there is no time for question answer session. Thank you, uh, Mundas and Bernal Mana team for giving us the opportunity. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you, team Paul, Dr. Kunyumaydin, Dr. Muntas for making me a part of this program. Thank you very much. Thank you, our dear faculty uh, and chairpersons for the session. That was the end of the first three lectures. We are moving on to the next three lectures and I request the uh, speakers to kindly stick on to the time as much as possible. But it being a PG teaching program, we don't want to interfere in between and cut short your lecture also. That is also there, but uh, I think somewhere in between we can strike a balance. So uh, let me take this opportunity to introduce our next, uh, next chairpersons for this evening. Is Dr. Jodi Ramesh Chandran, Madam is the additional professor at the Government Medical College, Calicut. Madam was the Calicut Gynecology Society president and is also the corresponding author for the Journal of Obstetric and Gynecology Society of India since 2017. Madam is the corresponding editor. Welcome to you, Madam, to this session. And next chairperson is Dr. Nasir T. Sir was also my teacher at Calicut Medical College. And sir is the laparoscopic and robotic surgeon, uh, now working in Astro Mims Calicut. Uh, sir is, is uh, MBBS and MD from Calicut Medical College and also MRCOG and FRCOG. Over to you, Jodi Madam and Nasa, sir, for the next session. So at the onset, <clears throat> I would like to thank Fox, KFOG and Foxy for including myself and Nasa in this uh, event. I think there are a set of three uh, lectures in this uh, preventive oncology section. Uh, can I have the uh, resume of the first speaker? Yes, ma'am. Can you see? No, no. So our first speaker is Dr. Neeta Sridharan, Assistant Professor, Gynec Oncology, Cochin Cancer Research Center. She has 70, 17 years of post-PG experience. She was our colleague at Calicut Medical College. She got a AJOI fellowship, Dr. Chitratara. And today she's going to talk on HPV vaccination. On to you, Dr. Neeta. Is Tita not there? Yes, ma'am. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you so much, ma'am. And at the outset, let me uh, thank uh, Dr. Mumtas, Dr. Santosh Kuriakos, and the Foxy and KFO for giving me this opportunity. And it's my pleasure and privilege to be in the session chaired by my dear Jyoti, madam. And also, I feel honored and at the same time intimidated to be in the podium after the pioneers Amita ma'am and uh, Nirja ma'am and also my great teacher, Prasanna ma'am. So hope the slide is shared and it's visible to all. Yes, yes. Yeah. So the HPV vaccine and the implications. Second. Slide, slides. In the slide is yeah, one second. Uh, I have a technical problem. Slide down. Okay. So one woman dies of cervical cancer every two minutes, and each you one. Can the slideshow. Uh, uh, I think it's on not working. Yes. On the top. On the top. Slideshow here on the top. Where? Oh, okay, one second. Slideshow yeah. on the top. There is a slideshow on the top. That file inserted draw design on the top. 
slide show. Oh, okay, fine. Yeah, on the oh. top, on the top, above, above that. Um, Design transition animation slideshow. One second. Design. Sorry. No, no. Just right above. Right above. You are. Uh, yeah. 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 Okay. Right. Fine. Uh, sorry. Uh, so one woman dies of cervical cancer every two minutes, and each one is a tragedy, and we can prevent it," said Director General WHO in his call to action to the countries. In all uh, globally, a call to action was given in May 2018. And this later on uh, led to the development of the first ever global strategy to accelerate the elimination of cervical cancer as a public health problem. And this is in the WHO publications in 2020. So why is a global strategy required? As we all know, cervical cancer is a preventable disease and it is curable if detected early. So the projected increase by WHO in the annual number of cancer cervix between 2018 and 2013 in the new cases from 570,000 to 700,000 and deaths from 311,000 to 400,000 if we don't have any effective interventions. And the sad part is more than 85% of those affected are young and they are in their most productive life, both economically and socially. And few diseases, uh, apart from cancer cervix, reflect global inequities as much as cancer cervix. The incidence is twice high in low middle income countries and the death is thrice high. And why we need a global strategy to eliminate cervical cancer, we all know. But then what does it put forth? The WHO proposes a vision of a world where cervical cancer is eliminated. When you say eliminated, we mean that it is no more a public health problem. So to achieve that, we have to have an incidence less than four lakh, four per 100,000 women years. And then you can say the cervical cancer is eliminated as a public health problem. For this, WHO has put forth the 1970-90 targets. And for the first time ever, the world has committed to eliminate a cancer. And so what are the targets? We all know 90% of the girls fully vaccinated with HPV vaccine by 15 years of age. And again, 70% uh, are screened using a high performance test first at the age of 35 years and again, a second round at 45 years of age. And 90% of the women with cervical cancer and pre-cancers treated or managed. And why not screening alone? because many Latin American countries where they have introduced cervical screening programs, organized structured cervical screening programs, they found that it didn't have much impact on the cervical cancer burden as was thought before. So they are now recently reorganizing their screening programs. So a screening program takes a minimum of 10 to 15 years to evolve, even if it is introduced in a developed world. And the preventive potential is substantially augmented by an HPV vaccination program if it is there along with your screening program. And why vaccinate? We know what is the necessary cause of cervical cancer, the persistent infection with one of the oncogenic types of human papilloma virus. It is there in virtually all cervical cancers. In addition to the cancer cervix, a considerable proportion of the anus, vulva, vagina, penis, and oropharynx also is caused by HPV, virus HPV types. And Hence, we know that there is strong evidence to suggest that HPV vaccination is the most effective long-term intervention and high HPV vaccination will lead to herd immunity as well. So in India, at any given time, about 6.6% women have HPV infection and out of these, HPV 16 and 18 contributes to 80% of the cervical cancer. Globally, it is about 70% and 63% of the high-grade lesions, and 75% of the sexually active harbor at least one HPV types. And it's a, HPV is a non-enveloped, small, double-stranded DNA and has got early fragments as well as late fragments. And HPV vaccines doesn't contain a genome, contains virus-like particle. It is empty shells formed by the purified L1 protein synthesized by recombinant DNA technology. And now coming on to the types of HPV vaccine, we all know there are three, bivalent, quadrivalent, and the nonavalent. Nonavalent is not yet marketed in India. And 
the, both the bivalent and quadrivalent covers the hyris types 16 and 18. In quadrivalent, apart from the uh, high risk 16 and 18, it has 6 and 11 as well. They are the low risk, which uh, give rise to the anogenital warts. The nonavalent, in addition to the 16 and 18, covers 31, 33, 45, 52, and 58 high risk types. And the adjuvant is aluminum hydroxide in bivalent, whereas in quadrivalent and nonavalent, it is aluminum hydroxy phosphate sulfate. And coming on to the safety, the WHO position paper in 2017 clearly states that HPV vaccine is safe and effective. So between 2006 and 2017, more than 100 million adults and girls have received at least one dose of HPV vaccine. And to date, more than 350 million doses have been administered. And no serious adverse event linked to HPV vaccine has been demonstrated and there is an excellent safety profile. So previously, there were concerns about uh, orthostatic tachycardia, postural tachycardia syndrome, and regional pain syndrome, Guillain-Barre. And it, now it is clearly, uh, there is clear cut evidence that it's not at all related to the vaccine. And these usual side effects are uh, which we have for all vaccination. And the vaccine safety is regularly being monitored by the WHO Global Advisory Committee for Vaccine Safety, and it is periodically being reviewed. And the contraindications, allergy to yeast or yeast products, allergy to any previous dose of HPV vaccine, and pregnancy and lactation in patients with moderate or severe acute illness. So coming on to the efficacy, we have a beautiful paper by Shankar Narayan sir, Nirja Ma'am and Partha Basu sir about the current global status and impact of human papillomavirus implications for India. So the table clearly gives uh, the efficacy. So we have for the bivalent vaccine, the famous Patricia and the Costa Rica vaccine trial. So it demonstrates an efficacy of about 94.9% and 88.7% respectively. And for the quadrivalent vaccine, we have the future one and the future two trials and with an efficacy of about 98.2%. Now, coming on to the target population, the CDC and the ACOG recommends routine vaccination, either bivalent or quadrivalent, to all, regardless of gender, that is boys and girls, from 11 to 12 years. And IAP for all girls, that is Indian Academy of Pediatricians, for all girls from 13 through 45 years, if affordable. But then our FOXY GCPR clearly states that the target group, the preferred target group is nine to 14 years. And girls aged less than nine should not receive HPV vaccines. And the titers in, uh, induced by both vaccines are two times higher in girls aged 10 to 15 years than older girls. They have a brisk immune response. And coming on to the recommendations, uh, most of the recommendations I adopted from the FOXY GCPR because it's clear cut. and uh, so this we have already discussed and then coming on to the interval if it is the two dose regime uh, so that means less than 15 years it's the two dose regime and you have to give it in between zero and six months the second dose may be given at an interval of five to 15 months but never less than five months because the uh, uh, immune B cells, the memory B cells take time to mature at least four to six months to develop uh, the, uh, mem uh, to become the brisk immune mem uh, B cells. And then coming on to the three doses, that is the bivalent, it is 016 and quadrivalent, it is 026. And coming on to catch up vaccination, that is to the age group, 15 to 26 years. The HPV vaccination is effective in the HPV naive population. That is, it should be given before the, ideally before the sexual debut. So we have to counsel them regarding reduced efficacy and importance of screening. And coming on to older age group, again, you, uh, it, they are the target group for screening. And in a country of ours, uh, considering the availability, we should target more in the younger age group. And coming on to special situations. So HIV positive or immunocompromised, they should receive three doses regardless of age. And when you have an interrupted dose, don't 
cancel the vaccination series, continue with the remaining doses. And pregnancy and lactation, it's not recommended, but then you don't have to do a NEMTP and can be given during lactation. And victims of sexual abuse, it is same, uh, like uh, uh, the same age recommendations apply. And women with history of abnormal screening reports, as we all know, the efficacy is reduced. And so what is more important is regular follow-up and adherence to the screening protocols. And coming to vaccination in males, Foxy GCPR currently doesn't uh, uh, recommend vaccine for males because our primary target group should be uh, females less than 15 years. And uh, what does the latest evidence say. So a recent paper from uh, published in the England Journal of Medicine in 2020, a Swedish study em emphasized the uh, importance of HPV vaccination uh, in the younger age group. The reduction in the number of cervical cases of cervical cancer was considerably low when they were vaccinated less than 17 years of age. And this paper again uh, underscores the safety and uh, efficacy profile of HPV vaccination. And coming on to the current status of access to HPV vaccine, more than 10 countries have introduced it into their national immunization scheme. And Australia was the first country to introduce it to their national immunization schedule. And less than 25, as of now, the WHO 2020 data gives us less than 25% of the low income countries, less than 30% of the low middle income countries, and about 85% of the high income countries have introduced immunization. And WHO's uh, position papers has given certain key recommendations for those who are going to introduce national immunization program. There is no doubt that we should have a national immunization program. WHO recommends that routine HPV vaccination should be included in national immunization programs. And the target age group as for Foxy GCPR, it is nine to 14 years, females, girls. And uh, the choice of HPV vaccine, WHO clearly states that considering the immunogenicity, efficacy and effectiveness, the bivalent, quadrivalent and nonovalent are comparable. Hence, our choice of HPV vaccine should be based upon the population, the target population, uh, the, the product characteristics, the price, the supply, the availability, and not just uh, on the, uh, uh, the virus groups, virus types which they cover. And uh, vaccination of multiple age cohorts. So whenever you introduce vaccination into your national immunization schedule, you have to have multiple cohorts of age between 9 14 or 9 to 18 years and this will increase and in uh, th this will give an estimated increase in the direct protection and herd immunity at a faster rate and co-administration yes it can be safely co-administered with other non-life and live vaccines but then separate syringes and different injection sites has to be used so the best, uh, like when you are going to introduce in the national immunization program, this is very important. So you can have it along with the booster dose of tetanus diphtheria vaccination. And coming on to the interchangeability, ideally not. The data are limited. But then if you don't know about the prior doses, there is no need to cancel the whole schedule. You can. Then again, before we introduce in we have to learn the uh, lessons from the previously introduced groups. So Catherine et al. in their study in 2017 uh, elaborates the lessons learned from 45 low middle income countries uh, immunization schedule. So the major challenges were the high vaccine prices, recent supply challenges and the rising anti-vaccine movement. Hence, a strong political will and commitment and inter and intra-department coordination and commit from, commitment from healthcare professionals is very important. And coming on to what does this uh, uh, WHO's uh, strategy will have the, what impact will it have? So obviously it has, it is the impact of universal vaccination as well. So 97, if you have achieved 90, 70, 90 targets by 2030, 62 million cervical cancer deaths can be averted and 74 million cases can also be averted. And 
Now we are in the pandemic for last one year. So we all know that prevention is very much better than cure. And also we are worried about the economic impacts as well. And vaccination gives us uh, 250,000 women will remain productive members of the workforce. And this will add to the world economy of about 28 billion US dollars. And other recent developments, and for the slides, I uh, acknowledge my uh, gratitude to Dr. Jyoti Meena from AIMS in her recent presentation in Bangladesh Ganyonko uh, Committee. So in India, it is approved by the National Technical Committee, Advisory Committee for Vaccination. And it is recently introduced in uh, Delhi, uh, 2016 in Delhi and Punjab, and in 2018 in Sikkim. And a Chinese vaccine, Sikolin, it's a bivalent vaccine, is currently under review by WHO for prequalification. And in India also, a quadrivalent vaccine is undergoing a multicentric phase three trial. And uh, nonavalent vaccine, may, in May 2021, we may have a limited supply in India. And to conclude, cervical cancer elimination as a public health problem is possible by the end of the century. And this results in 97% reduction in cervical cancer incidence in LMIC. So to have that, you have you should have both high HPV vaccination coverage as well as a systematic organized structural screening program. Even the HPV vaccinated cohorts should have the regular screening programs. And uh, most relevant, this is quite relevant for countries with highest cancer burden like India. And since we all have received our first shot of COVID vaccine, which is very recently introduced into the market, why are we waiting to be the advocates of HPV vaccination with such an excellent safety and efficacy profile? And this is the statue in front of uh, uh, WHO to commemorate the 30th anniversary of eradication of smallpox. So this is possible in case of CA cervix as well. Together we can make history, it's within our reach as is said by the Secretary General in the foreword of the cancer strategy by 2020 by WHO. Thank you all. Thank you Dr. Neeta for that excellent presentation and bringing out the overview of the vaccine. And as you said, the 75% of women do carry HPV but why don't they develop antibodies? The same thing like COVID. We are, uh, people are exposed to COVID. They have developed antibodies, but they may not be long lasting. That's why the vaccine is needed for even COVID positive patients after 28 days. Because um, I would just add a few sentences that HPV infection does not produce the viremia and it does not cross the blood um, uh, it does not cause the, the blood-borne infection and it does not release the pro-inflammatory cytokines and it has released, uh, it has got limited expression in the late viral capsid proteins and it does not lyse the keratin uh, regularly and there's little tissue destruction and no activation of APC. Because of these things, the immunity does not develop to a woman even if she develops infection. So definitely vaccine has its role and definitely it should come down in our vaccine schedule. And one more thing is the adult women studies, when they gave it to adult women, they found that if you give it at 24 to 25 years, only 91% efficacy. At 24 to 34, it is 92. And at 38 to 45, it is 89. So definitely catch them young is what should be the goal. Thank you, Dr. Nita. I think we can move on. I request Thank Dr. You, introduce the next speaker. Dr. Nasser. I think the next speaker is going to talk on approach to CIN, Dr. Vichya. She's the director of Institute of Obstetric and Gynecology, Egmore, Madras Medical College, comes from city of Chennai and special interest in high-risk pregnancy, infertility, laparoscopy. She's got of lots of credits with best paper award in 2015 AICOG and best doctor award from Tamil Nadu. On to Dr. Vijaya for overview on CIN. 
good evening. At the outset, I would like to thank uh, uh, Foxy Oncology Committee and my special thanks to thank Kerala Society and Mumtaj uh, for giving me this opportunity. Uh, it's a wonderful topic and it is a need of the, our uh, approach to CAN. That is the topic. I'm able to speak uh, today on behalf of uh, Medas Medical College. My topic is on approach to CAN. So the CAN is usually, you all should know it is from the result of a cervical biopsy. Uh, so the biopsy results can come either a CAN 1, 2, 3, or adenocarcinoma in situ or invasive cancer. So why are we worried? Once we diagnose CAN1, the risk, the persistence or progression to carcinoma uh, is more, all the more in high grades uh, like CAN2 and 3. CAN3, almost 12% goes in for invasive carcinoma. So when you uh, get a case of CAN1 on biopsy, uh, it indicates there might be a HPV infection. And this is similar to ASCUS with HP positive or low-grade squamous lesion in pap smear. The risk of progression to invasive cancer is around 1% if left untreated. Uh, so uh, whenever you get a case of CA in 1, you just first uh, see what is the pap report and what is the HPV report. If the patient has already HPV positive or if they are of ASCUS group or low-grade squamous epithelial lesion, we have two years to follow the case. And because the chances of becoming normal at the routine screening is more high in the case of CAN1, uh, so the repeat cytology should be done at the end of one year. If it is negative, then we can go in for routine screening, either pap smear every three years or co-testing every five years. But if the CAN1 is persistent, really positive, even after one year, you have to go for a colposcopy. And if the colposcopy is normal, you again go in for a routine screening. But if there is a CAN2 or 3, if the CAN1 progresses, then we have to definitely treat. At the same time, if the CAN1 is uh, showing a PAP report as ACH or HCL, definitely the colposcopy is a must. And if the colposcopy is adequate with the squamous columnar junction entirely visible, if the transformation zone entirely visible, you can go for co-testing after one year if the patient is compliant. But if you think the patient is non-compliant, then you have to treat the patient either with ablative or excisional treatment. And also if the colposcopy is inadequate also, even though it is CAN1, but in the presence of head still, you have to treat by ablative or excisional treatment. Coming to say in two or three, uh, these cases progress to uh, cancer very fast. A uh, five percent in the case of CAN two and twelve percent in the case of CAN three. So these uh, patients definitely should be uh, treated and follow up without treatment is unacceptable and. Uh, don't ever think of hysterectomy in the case of CA in two or three. I've seen so many patients uh, uh, coming with a report of CA in three and asking for hysterectomy. So whenever the patient has CA in two or three on biopsy, check the colposcopy report. If again the colposcopy report is adequate, adequate means you have the entire squamous columnar junction visible, you have the entire transformation zone visible, then you can go in for excision or ablation. But if the colposcopy is inadequate, or if you think there is an endocervical involvement, then you better go in for excision and don't opt for ablation treatment. In pregnancy, of course, depending upon the grades of lesion, either low grade or high grade, or if it is an invasive cancer, low grade lesion you can manage and with colposcopy after six weeks postpartum. In high grade lesion, you have to do colposcopy every trimester and then you review after six weeks postpartum. But invasive cancer, you have to offer treatment according to the period of gestation. And coming to the adenocarcinoma in situ on biopsy, you have to do colonization and rule out the disease. If it is an invasive cancer, you will go for hysterectomy. But if the young woman desires of fertility, if the margins are positive, uh, you have to again re-excise the uh, margin or you can go for co-testing, uh, colposcopy and endocervical curettage six months later. But if the margins are negative, we can again go for follow-up. So the follow-up of the patient is very, very important in all uh, CN1, 2 and 3. 
and um, you have to have the uh, phone number of the patient, address of the patient. Uh, the main uh, problem we are facing is following the patient because they don't come back to us. We have to call them and we have to register them and we have to follow the PA in patients. And the treatment again, thermal ablation, you all know it's either a thermal or a cryo or a laser ablation. Excisional, again, it is a leap, cold knife conization or laser conization. And ablative procedure is very, very advantageous. It's an office this procedure. It doesn't need an anesthesia. Um, but the only disadvantage is uh, you cannot send the specimen for a histology. Uh, but to do the cryo, the entire lesion should be visible. And larger lesions cannot be, uh, cryocortic cannot be done. And a prior histological confirmation is a must to do the cryotherapy. Thermal ablation is also coming into vogue now. It's also a OP procedure, uh, but the recurrence rate is slightly higher. And now only thermal ablation is coming uh, slowly. Uh, the cryotherapy we had been using for a long time, three minutes, five minutes, three minutes, freeze, thaw, and freeze. The formation of uh, ice crystals, uh, either using carbon dioxide or nitrous oxide, the depth of destruction of the cryo uh, is five millimeter. And the disadvantage of cryo is profuse basal discharge. Laser, you all know, it's a very, very, um, a very good procedure. And the depth of uh, destruction is 5 to 7 millimeter. But it is a relatively expensive equipment. And this is a picture showing the cryotherapy before and after. And uh, loop electro excision procedure. It's also called as a large loop excision of the transformation zone. This is a currently the treatment of choice for PL1 and uh, 2 and 3. And you have to use the... Uh, either an arched loop or you can even use a straight wire. In that case, it's called sweats. The leap is applicable anywhere in the lower gentle tract, but in the service, you have to use uh, LEDs. The LEDs is uh, uh, usually for all CAN, uh, but the contraindication is if the woman has recently delivered, you have to wait for uh, three months to do the LEDs, and there should not be any PAD. And they put the patient in lithotomy position, always use the correct size of the loop. And the electrosurgical power should be 30 to 40 watts. And it should be a single pass. You always swipe from the lateral to medial. Because if you go from anterior to posterior, there is a chance of injury to the bladder or the rectum. And you can also coagulate the base of the cone by rollerball electrode if there is a bleeding. And the advantage of LEDs is you get a sample for histopathological examination. And but the complications are there, like uh, sometimes you get inadvertent burns to the vagina and cervical stenosis and incompetence at a later stage of the um, uh, patient becomes pregnant. The disadvantage is that special training is required and thermal damage, sometimes the margin of the specimen, uh, you cannot uh, see clearly. Uh, the hemostasis, as I said, you can either use a roller ball or you can use a monocell's paste or silver nitrate or sometimes you can even use a chromic character suturing. Uh, the main advice you should give is avoid uh, douche and intercourse or vaginal medications two weeks after leap. And follow up, you have to keep on following the patient first one week for the histopathology. At one month, again, you reassess. At six and 12 months, again, you do the via and colposcopy. And cold neck conization, you all know using uh, the knife or even you can use uh, even laser, but laser is relatively expensive and expertise is required. And the indications for conization, you all know whenever there is a cytology, histology disparity and recurrent high grade lesion, larger lesions, more than 50% of the cervix involved, when you suspect adenocarcinoma in situ and when the lesion is extending into the endocervical canal. And uh, uh, the main thing is uh, complications is the stenosis and incompetence uh, like LEDs. Uh, and you can have a hemorrhage and uh, you should not dilate the cervix prior to the procedure as it alters the cellular pattern. And the post excision margin, if it is negative, you can follow the patient with code testing uh, one year, three years, and every six months cytology and then yearly. But positive, you should definitely consider hysterectomy. But if uh, fertility preservation is needed, again, you have to follow the patient with PAP and ECC uh, frequently at six months interval. The indication for hysterectomy in CAN is uh, adenocarcinoma in situ, older woman, recurrent high grade lesion. And when you are not able to follow up the patient and the CA in three where the cone margins are involved and post hysterectomy also, whenever you have done a hysterectomy for CAN, you have to follow the patient with the, a pap smear and HPV at six months and 18 months. According to the American Society of Colposcopists, the recommendation is now on risk assessment with the current results and past history. 
and if the risk assessment is greater than 4%, uh, then you have to calculate uh, uh, the treatment has to be expedited 60 to 100%. Uh, and if the risk is uh, 25 to 59%, uh, even colposcopy is acceptable. But if the risk is only 4 to 24%, colposcopy alone is recommended. Whereas if the risk assessment is not greater than 4%, then you can uh, do a five-year risk assessment for everything is given as a table in the ASCCP website. Based on that, you can do either a colposcopy or you can periodically follow up the patient. This is the 2019 latest um, protocol. And WHO, everybody was talking about that. At 2030, we have to, 90% of the girls should be vaccinated and 70% should be screened at 35 to 40 years and 90% of the disease of CSF should be treated. So our target should be 30% reduction in the mortality from cervical cancer according to the SDG 2030 target 3.4. So the take back message to workers, the CAN has a risk of progression to cancer to 1%. CAN1 can be followed with co-testing every year for two years and CAN persisting beyond two years need to be treated and CA in two and three require immediate treatment. Routine hysterectomy is not advised. Cryotherapy and LEAP are the commonly used techniques. Thank you so much for the opportunity. Thank you, Dr. Vijaya, for that elaborating on CIN. Uh, has Dr. Nasr joined? Uh, sir is joining, madam, actually. Maybe by the end of the session, he will be with us. Okay. Shall I we take uh, uh, we can uh, proceed to the next talk. I think uh, it's uh, on cancer cervix complicating pregnancy by Dr. Dhanya. Can I have her uh, CV? She is from Government Medical College Trivandrum, Fellow in Gynec Oncology from RCC Trivandrum, currently assistant professor at RCC, MCH trainee in any call. On to you, Dr. Dhanya. Hello, ma'am. Am I audible? Yeah. Yeah, Dhanya. Please. I'm uh, sharing the... <coughs> Are the slides visible, ma'am? Yeah. Slides show you. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Good evening, respected faculty members and dear friends. Uh, at the outset, I would like to thank the organizers uh, for giving me this platform. My topic for the talk is uh, cervical cancer complicating pregnancy. I have uh, tried my best to stick to the time and make it as simple for the students. So going on to the talk, uh, we know that uh, the incidence of cancer increases during the as age advances and with more and more women giving birth beyond 30 to 35 years of age, delaying their pregnancies, we are bound to uh, come across more of cancer complicating pregnancy. The common cancers seen complicating pregnancies are uh, uh, gynecologic cancers, breast cancers and hematologic cancers. And as expected among gynecologic cancers, cervical cancer is the commonest one that we come across in pregnancy. Now, cancer in pregnancy comes, uh, comes with a multitude of issues like oncologic issues, uh, we have to plan the timing of therapy, the type of therapy, maternal effects, uh, maternal surveillance during the therapy, obstetric issues like uh, timing the delivery, uh, mode of delivery, fetal effects of therapy, anti antipartum fe fetal surveillance, corticosteroid administration, etc. And also many social and ethical issues like uh, terminating the pregnancy, fetal uh, viability, right to autonomy and uh, the mother's overall prognosis. And at, along, along with this, we also have to take into account a uh, many of the confounding factors that pregnancy present, like the changes in maternal physiology, the dynamic anatomy, changes in dynamic anatomy and uh, fetal considerations. Coming to cervical changes in pregnancy, uh, we come across in, increased uh, cervical volume, hypervascularity, which gives a bluish hue to the cervix, which is exaggerated with acetic acid. Also, there is stromal hypertrophy and edema, which makes it appear more uh, suspicious. Also, endometrial cells with uh, area stellar reaction or decidual reaction may be seen shed in the cervical smear, giving a um, high-grade appearance to the cervical smear. About screening in pregnancy, is it mandatory to screen women during pregnancy? 
uh, in a country where a systematic uh, screening is always in, already in place, it may not be uh, necessary to screen women during pregnancy, but in a developing country like ours, where a systematic screening program is not there nationally, prenatal visits offer a good opportunity for screening. Screening in pregnancy is done by HPV, uh, sorry, by pap smears and HPV DNA testing is not recommended for screening during pregnancy. Abnormal cytology is quite common, seen in up to 5% of smears taken during pregnancy. Now, uh, once you get an abnormal cytology during pregnancy, what is your next step? As in a non-pregnant woman, evaluation of abnormal cytology would be by colposcopy and directed biopsies. And your primary goal during pregnancy uh, in evaluating an abnormal cytology would be to identify invasive carcinoma. So all abnormal smears, the patient goes in for corposcopic evaluation and biopsy from the abnormal areas. Uh, physiological changes, again, may mask the gross and corposcopic appearance of uh, pathology. However, the uh, presence of punctations, mosaicism, atypical vessels of friable lesions should be considered suspicious. As I said, the primary goal is to rule out malignancy. The uh, and whenever high, uh, suspicious lesions are identified, directed biopsies are taken from the highest uh, looking, most suspicious area of the lesion. Random biopsies are avoided because biopsies in a hypervascular cervix may lead to hemorrhage. The complication rates for a colposcopic biopsy is quite low, only around 0.6%. Hemorrhage is the most common one. Endocervical curettage is uh, contraindicated during pregnancy. Whenever a high-grade lesion is suspected by corposcopy, it's advisable to rule out invasive cancer by uh, taking a shallow co cone. And in pregnancy, the term used for a shallow cone is a coin biopsy, and this is used to rule out invasive carcinoma. And again, uh, when uh, once invasive cancer has been ruled out by a uh, uh, biopsy, Corposcopy can, uh, can be repeated every trimester to assess the lesion progression. Colonization, as I said, is uh, done only when there is a high suspicion of invasive cancer. And as uh, far as invasive cancer is ruled out, precancerous lesions can be kept under follow-up during the pregnancy and treatment can be done six to eight weeks postpartum. And for precancerous uh, lesions, the route of delivery is strictly based on standard obstetric indications. As is in this, not indicated just for the sake of a uh, uh, just for the presence of a precancerous lesion. Going on to cervical cancer per se, when do we go on to imaging the uh, patients for uh, all stage one A, that is microscopic cancers. Uh, 1A1 and 1, uh, 1A2, and also small 1B1 tumors, macroscopic tumors, which are uh, small. 1B1 would include less than 2 centimeter tumors, but small 1B1 tumors, less than 1 centimeter. In such patients, uh, extra cervical disease is not expected. So a routine imaging can be omitted. For all patients higher than this, that is 1B1 tumors, which are more than 1 centimeters, larger 1B1, 1B2, or any other uh, higher stage, and also higher risk histology, which is other than squamous cell carcinoma. When you come across adeno or small cell carcinoma, an MRI is indicated to uh, rule out extra cervical disease. An MRI would uh, give you an assessment of the tumor size, parametrial invasion, and also spread to lymph nodes and adjacent organs. Now, coming to treatment of cervical cancer, it would depend on a number of factors like gestational age, the stage of disease, lymph node status, and also whether the patient uh, desires to terminate the present pregnancy, and also whether she uh, desires future pregnancies. A definitive treatment, regardless of gestational age, would be indicated in advanced disease like documented nodal meds, which I'll come to soon. And also when there is progression of disease during pregnancy. So I'll uh, go on to the management of each stage one by one. For stage 1A1 tumors, that is less than uh, those with less than three millimeter stromal invasion, microscopic tumors. And when there is no lymph vascular space invasion. Now this is one uh, parameter that you will be uh, getting only by your excision biopsy, the cone biopsy. The pathologist which will tell you whether lymph vascular space invasion is present or not. So when uh, in 1A1 tumors with no LVSI, 
the conization itself is a good enough treatment. As I said earlier, coin biopsy, which is not deep enough to cause damage to the fetal membranes, will do, will suffice. And uh, it's ideally done between 12 to 20 weeks of pregnancy, but uh, it's avoided within four weeks of the EDC. It's done in OT with adequate an anesthesia and a prophylactic circlage may be placed for the prevention of preterm labor. Complications of conization, mainly hemorrhage, also miscarriage, preterm rupture of membranes, preterm labor or infections. Now we move on to the next stage, that is the 1A1 tumors, microscopic tumors with LVSI. Also 1A2, that is the three to uh, tumors, microscopic tumors with three to five millimeters of stromal invasion and 1B1 tumors, that is tumors less than uh, two centimeter in size and a macroscopic. For all these uh, tumors, there is a slightly higher risk of involvement of lymph nodes. So before going on to a definite treatment, you need to make sure whether the nodes are negative or positive. So a staging lymphadenectomy is in, uh, recommended for all these patients before definitive treatment. And the staging lymphadenectomy is, uh, involves the uh, dissection of bilateral pelvic lymph nodes. It may be done laparoscopically before 14 to 16 weeks of gestation or by laparotomy up to 22nd weeks of gestation. Beyond 22nd weeks of gestation, a staging lymph, uh, a lymphadenectomy is not recommended because the nodal yield is found to be very low beyond this gestational age. And also, a uh, sentinel lymph node biopsy is contraindicated in pregnancy. Now, regarding laparoscopy in pregnancy, it is feasible and safe in uh, expert hands, and uh, it doesn't have much of fetal adverse effects. The issues we are concerned about in laparoscopy are hypercapnia, perforation of the uterus, and reduced blood flow due to increased abdominal pressure, and also the use of carbon dioxide. So the recommendations uh, by the major guidelines are to limit the operative time to about 90 to 120 minutes, maintain a low intra-abdominal pressure of around 10 to 13 millimeters of mercury, use open method of introduction of trochas. So uh, once, uh, as I said earlier, for uh, 1A2 to 1B1, you go on to a staging lymphadenectomy. And once they are confirmed to be no negative, what do you do next? If the, you discuss with the patient whether uh, she uh, desires continuation of pregnancy, and in case she wants preservation of the pregnancy, a simple trachelectomy would suffice in these patients because uh, up to stage 1B1, that is uh, two centimeter tumors. Uh, parametral extension is seen in less than one percentage of lymph node negative patients. A simple trachelectomy includes, uh, involves excision of the cervix one centimeter above the tumor, and it's not associated with much complications. Uh, other methods studied have been radical vaginal, ab abdominal, and laparoscopic trachelectomy. And though the uh, parametral excision in, is better in these procedures, the obstetric outcome is poor, and it's hence it's not recommended during pregnancy. Going on to stage 1B2 tumors, that is tumors more than 2 centimeters but less than 4 centimeters in diameter. Hello? Uh, less than 4 centimeters in diameter. These are again operable tumors where uh, you would um, consider radical hysterectomy. So again, in these cases, you uh, do a pelvic lymphadenectomy to make sure that the nodes are negative. And if the patient uh, desires preserving the pregnancy, you may give her neoadjuvant chemotherapy uh, to buy time until fetal maturity and subsequent surgery after downstaging the disease. Neoadjuvant chemotherapy stabilizes the tumor until fetal maturity. And uh, once fetal maturity is achieved, you can uh, perform cesarean delivery and radical hysterectomy in the same setting. For tumors uh, of stage 1B3, that is more than four centimeters, they have gone beyond our um, criteria for surgery. Here again, uh, pregnancy preserving management would mean neoadjuvant chemotherapy. It's not, uh, it doesn't have strong evidence to recommend it. Further research is warranted. Neoadjuvant chemotherapy, again, buys you time until fetal maturity is uh, attained. And uh, this is followed by a cesarean section to deliver the fetus. And uh, the definitive treatment would be concurrent chemoradiation. 
about the mode of delivery patients with micro invasive cancer that is stage 1a1 and 1a2 are not required to undergo cesarean section a gross lesion however is a contraindication to vaginal delivery because it risks tumor dissemination with uh, prolonged or obstructed labor and also episiotomy site recurrence and while do doing cesarean section it should be a vertical uh, uterine incision not extending into the lower segment it should maintain the integrity of the lower uterine segment for pathological assessment and it's also recommended that the placenta is uh, also sent for pathology now uh, when is termination of pregnancy indicated it's mainly in advanced disease stage 2b or higher or when lymph node mets are, uh, have been detected even in these cases if the patient or in cases when the patient chooses not to preserve a pregnancy if it is within the uh, time li uh, time limits for termination and in such cases treatment is planned without the in intention to preserve the fetus now when the patient uh, desires termination and it's an operable disease that is stage 1a2 to 1b2 uh, when uh, the patient desires termination you may do a radical either a radical hysterectomy with the fetus in utero during the first and early second trimesters or a hysterectomy followed by radical hysterectomy in the later second trimester and uh, in 1b3 or higher uh when the patient desires termination in the first trimester you may uh, try chemo radiation with the fetus in utero wherein uh, spontaneous abortion naturally ensues or in the early second trimester it may be a hysterectomy followed by chemo radiation now coming to a few uh, words about chemotherapy in pregnancy chemotherapy is contraindicated in the first trimester of gestation to avoid uh, uh, problems with organogenesis it's not also it's not recommended beyond 35 weeks uh, ideally a 3 week window is recommended between the la hello between the uh, i hope i'm audible yes three you're audible yes okay a 3 week window is uh, advocated between the last cycle of chemotherapy and delivery to allow uh, both the maternal and fetal bone marrow to recover and regarding ops obstetric care high risk high risk obstetric care in a well equipped center is recommended gestational complications should be assessed folic acid supplementation and nutritional counseling done to optimize the maternal and uh, fetal parameters fetal monitoring before and after uh, if surgery is done in between fetal monitoring to be done before and after surgery to detect fetal distress prophylactic use of tocolytics in case uterine manipulation is involved also after colonization serial cervical length measurements to assess the cervical incompetence vaginal progesterone is advised when residual cervical length is less than 25 uh, mm and also if there is no residual disease a cerclage can be considered patients receiving uh, antenatal chemotherapy should be monitored on a regular basis with serial ultrasounds to assess the inter interval growth and also uh, doppler as indicated and in cases uh, in patients undergoing surgery prophylaxis low molecular weight heparin is uh, indicated post operatively random and i see gayi madhi hai to conclude treatment of cancer can often be safely administered with good maternal and fetal outcomes chemotherapy and radiotherapy and surgery must be adapted to the pregnant state and counseling and emotional support are so, the management thank you so thank you dr dadia thank hello you. can i audible am i audible yes sir yes sir you are yeah thank you dr thank you for that excellent talk on uh, ca cervix though is a rare topic we need to know many about how the management good that laparoscopy as a role Uh, in the management for the lymphadenectomy lymphadenic in the early stages, and uh, the role of termination, when to terminate, all these areas are, uh, you know, uh, I mean, not properly known for the general gynecologist. So thank you for highlighting all these areas. So, Dr. Jodi, any comments? Yeah, Dr. Dania, can you give any experiences from RCC about in pregnancy, cancer cervix in pregnancy? Because we. Uh. actually ma'am we have not had any uh, operable cases diagnosed during pregnancy and i uh, am sure the radiotherapy uh, section would have had much more experience we have uh, in my short experience in rcc i have not come across an operable patient presenting in pregnancy 
Okay. Dr. Abraham was asking that you've written downstaging after NACT. Did you mean that downstaging? Uh, it just, uh, I meant, what I meant was to prevent the progression until fetal maturity is attained. Uh. Thank you, Dr. Danya. I think that brings us to the end of the session. I would like to thank Dr. Nita, Dr. Vijaya, and Dr. Danya, and thank Fox, Fox, uh, K Fox, and Foxy. And I think uh, Nasser also, uh, on behalf of Nasser also, I would like to extend thanks. We can move on. Okay. Uh, Dr. Danya, can you stop sharing the slide? For the thank you, ma'am. Yeah. Over to Dr. Leda now for the next two sessions on.